Okay. First, I need to inform everybody that this will be a recorded session. Welcome, everybody, to Nassau Alumni Chapters Social Action Hour, Woke Wednesday Live. The purpose of Woke Wednesday Live is to keep the community informed about some of the most prevalent issues of the day. This evening's uh, topic is mobilizing our communities, bridging intergenerational gaps. I would now like to introduce our chapter president, Ms. Jackie Morrison Brailsford, to bring you greetings. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much, Ms. Bryan. It brings me great pleasure to bring greetings on behalf of our 192 membership of NASA alumni chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. For those of you who do not know, our sorority was founded on the campus of Howard University on January 13, 1913. And it's so befitting with this topic today that we have as far as mobilizing our community and bridging inter intergenerational gaps because our first, our, our sorority's first public service act was that of on March 3rd, 1913, when you had collegiates 19 and 20 years old participate in the women's suffrage march among other women. So that's what it's going to take, that we band together as one generation within one another to support worthy causes. So I am so happy that we at Nassau Alumni Chapter are moving forward and keeping the action and social action on behalf of our communities. Thank you so much and enjoy. Thank you very much, Madam President. I will now bring you uh, Mrs. Grace Bryant to open us in prayer. Good evening, everyone. It's really a little devotion that I thought was appropriate for what's going on in this time and the people who are coming out to uh, be with us as we go through this change. It, it's taken from Psalm 130, 133, verse one. It's called, In Praise of Brotherly Love. And I think we've seen a lot of that during these days. This is a little story about a farmer who raised corn and for years, his corn cobs were the best in the United States. And then he decided to share some of his corn cobs with his neighbor. He shared his best with his neighbor. And people asked, well, why are you sharing your best corn, uh, corn seeds with your neighbor? And he said, well, when the wind blows, it blows on my corn seeds and it blows on my neighbor's corn seeds. So when my neighbor plants his corn and the wind blows, I want the best seeds to blow from his yard to my yard because if I give him the worst seeds or he plants the worst seeds that's what will blow into my yard and so then neither of us will proper and God as you taught us to share none of us will pro none of us will prosper if we don't share so we ask you to share whatever you're blessed with the, bless, the best that you have and whatever the best seeds you have so that we all can prosper. We ask this in Jesus' name. This is the message for us, for the world, and for those who are working with us as we grow to become, to do the work of God and make this world a better place. Amen. 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 Well, we have a few young activists with us this evening. And we thought in the, in the atmosphere we find ourselves in um, this uprising, it, it is important that we work together. You know, the momentum is in the hands of the young people right now, um, but often there have been um, friction, you know, generationally speaking. Um, so, in an effort to try to overcome that, we want to um, open this conversation up uh, to the community and just showcase some of the things that uh, people of all uh, generations have, are contributing to, to the movement. Um, today, we start with, like I said, a couple of our young activists, and I will give uh, Mr. Jacob Dixon some, some time to begin. I know 
uh, you have been in the fight prior to the uprisal. Um, so just share a little bit about what you've been doing in the county community. So, sure, well, uh, good evening, first and foremost, and thank you um, to the NASA Alumni Chapter for allowing me to be a part of this space with you all. Uh, my name is Jacob Dixon, so greeting everyone. I am founder and CEO of Choice for All. Um, we are a nonprofit that's in Roosevelt, but we also provide services, organizing, and policy work around Nassau County uh, to ensure that no matter your zip code, that every child and every family thrives and they're healthy. Um, our work around this and being intentional behind black and brown issues continues to expand. Um, I come to the space also as a community organizer. Um, I've helped rally youth organizers in different communities to set up their own protests around Black Lives Matter. Um, in addition to really taking on more of a logistics role in how do we coordinate policy efforts with on the ground action so there's no disconnect but accurate information is being presented for folks to know what's going on. And so um, that's been a role that I've been playing um, recently um, and I'm still growing in my role as an organizer. I think there's things that you often recognize that uh, you, you know, you learn from your past and from your elders. And so I'm still doing that the best way I can, but also striving to make sure that we fight for inclusivity and justice um, for Black Long Island and how we're able to do so, particularly here in Nassau County. I'm sorry, Kira, I think your, uh, your mic is uh, muted. <laughs> you're giving me this respect, <laughs> but you're good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing, uh, Jacob. Uh, I'd like to now go to uh, Ms. Des Bros or um, Deja Williams. Uh, either one of you guys could jump in. Uh, in your position as in your position at Dej as um, the person in charge of organizing the collegiate members of uh, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated in the area, uh, please share some of the things. Um, that you are doing uh, in regards to social action, um, as well as some of the challenges that uh, you might, you guys might be facing in your organizing efforts. Thank you, Sir Brian. So my name is Nadej Jabros. Uh, I am the New York Metro State Facilitator for Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Good evening, Soros. Um, so some of the things that the collegiates have been doing is. They've been going out to protesting. I've seen a lot of food drives happening and they're doing it on their own. Um, I've seen plenty of stores reach, more so reach out to me and ask me, hey, can you help me spread the word? Which I think is amazing. We have stores who have started their own um, protest groups and they've been out in the city, they've been out in Long Island, they've been upstate New York and they're doing a fantastic job. I think one of the biggest challenges we're facing is COVID-19. A lot of us do have parents who are very concerned for us. And I know I just had a, conver I had a very long conversation with my mother a few weeks ago about that I need to go out. And she was like, I feel nervous you're going to get sick and it's not safe. And I think that's the biggest challenges that we're having is that these collegiates and we have to have these conversations about our need to participate um, and going out and really showing our faces and showing that there needs to be a change and that we want to be a part of this movement. So thank you. And Deja, I know you have that social action fire in you, so I, I just want to give you a chance as well to uh, share some of the things that you're involved in as far as mobilizing collegiates. Um, hi, everyone. Again, my name is Deja Williams. I am a recent graduate of Adelphi, a former member of the Pi Tau chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Square Incorporated. Um, I feel like it's it's been very surreal for this generation because a lot of a lot of our first interactions with police brutality and social justice like visually the need for social justice came from early stories of I'd say as early as Trayvon Martin for me personally that that was the real big big thing for everyone and most of us were maybe like 18 around then. So we didn't really have the freedom to say, mom, I wanna go out and protest and her to be like, um, okay. And the protests weren't on such a wide scale. And now that most of us are in our twenties, 
and it and we're venturing out and we have all of these different personalities and aspects that we're growing into within ourselves we're bringing that to the forefront and we're making ourselves known and we're making our own way to be part of this movement and get the things that we know and deserve so it's it's been really shocking to having learned about the people at forefronts of movements and then turning around and seeing my peers at the forefronts of these movements thank you thank you so much um let me go back to jacob um i have a, a couple of questions we came up with um that we just want to you know see get some feedback from our younger activists out there um whose boots are on the ground so first what is your view of the black lives matter movement and how do you compare it to the civil rights movement of, of the past uh so for me i think that there are a lot of commonalities as far as tactics and structure um, and I think the goals, while they may be some distinctive, I think they do share some commonalities in it. So in particular, you know, for Black Lives Matter, what we're really focusing on here is the validity of Black life, simply put in that aspect. You know, we're looking at this as more so striving for Black liberation. And because it's so broad um, in terms of what that looks like, it could go across different sectors. So it's not just limited towards just policy, but it's also looking in terms of businesses and opportunities, economics, education, health. I think there's a vast, broad perspective at which it's looking at because we want to make sure at the end of the day that as Black lives, that we are not targeted or demised in any way, no matter where we come from or what sector it is. Where I feel like the civil rights movement spoke also in terms of liberation, but it's specifically focusing through the lens of rights of citizenship. And how does that look in terms of the right for equal access to public facilities, for instance, or the right to vote and striving for it. So in a way, I feel like there are stepping stones at which the Black Lives Matter has moved on there, but I also think that it has created more of a broader category and access point um, in different ways, whereas the civil rights movement was targeted in specific actions that it was looking for. I think there were two different spaces in time that you know folks often try to figure out whether or not is there an argument or did one does more of a better job than the other and i feel like that loses the the real focus that we need to have in ensuring that our lives actually do matter in all facets of our um, society whether it is with education health income and more so i see them as stepping stones to one another and how they've been able to cross intersect even though there may be some differences between the two as far as tactics or reliability for instance with media and how we've seen access of it with Black Lives Matter being more apparent, whereas during the civil rights movement, we didn't have access to all the tools that we have now. So I think there's some very clear distinctions, um, but there's also similarities in terms of approach and focus. So that's my opinion on that. And, and just, just to get a little bit more from um, what you said, how do you deal with it when you come up against that, uh, that friction as I, as I, uh, described it earlier or that uh, the criticism of from whether it's from the older generation uh, viewing the approach the younger generation is taking or from the younger generation saying or not really uh, taking full I don't know I, 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 I would describe it as reverence in, in what was done in, in the past uh, what, what do you do to uh, try to quell that sort of I got you completely. Yeah, no, I think it's it's I think it comes down to bridging of education and awareness. Right? Like when we're talking about the different strategies around nonviolent protest and what we've seen as models of success, for instance, from the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and how those things came about, those were part of the civil rights movement that were utilizing similar tactics and strategies and forms of protest to ensure that we get our voices heard. And we've learned those tactics and experiences from modeling of other societal expertise when it came down to protesting on issues that matter to us. I think we oftentimes get distracted with who did the job better versus talking about what is our common focus here and how can we bridge the gap in terms of information and awareness. Because I've been in the conversations of where 
you know, folks have said, well, the elders are the gatekeepers. Not all elders are gatekeepers, but they have knowledge and information that we need to have an understanding about. Um, but at the same time, as young people, we also have the strength to keep going in certain things. Are we willing to have the door open for us to speak our voices and make sure that we're there? So I think there's some intentional conversations within the Black community that we need to have about bridging that gap. And I think it starts with really having a baseline of where do we learn this information from? What has been happening? How do we practice it? How do we model it? And then coming together with that sense of belonging by saying that we're all coming from a clear space of protecting our lives. We just need to be different in our approach and that's okay. Um, and we have to be willing to understand that. So I think that that's where I've often taken the approach in trying to struggle between the two is through education and awareness. Thank you. Nadej, I give it to you, same question. Uh, your views on the Black Lives Matter movement and uh, its comparison to the civil rights movement of the past. I wanna say ditto because uh, Jacob took all the words right out of my mouth. I really think <laughs> he just said it so eloquently. So I, I have to agree. There are so many similarities where we do have a main goal. We have a main focus. But I think the difference is, is we just have different tools. Um, this younger generation, we have social media and how we use all this information, video cameras, live streams, all these new unique tools of how to share information, how to get that information out quickly and bring things to everyone's attention where it's no longer just hearsay. It's like, here it is on a video point blank, these are the facts. It's not a he said, she said, they said, this is what happened. So you can't, you can't change that. Um, and I think that's one of the biggest differences of the Black Lives Matter movement. It's like, we're showing you this is exactly what's happening and how it's affecting our community versus us going to the people in power and saying, this is how we feel. Because you can try and validate my feelings, but you can't invalidate this video and you can't invalidate these photos. <laughs> um, so that's where I think the biggest thing comes from. I think the difference between our old generation, our younger generation, um, I think we need to communicate more. Um, I think we need to listen to understand instead of, instead of just listening to respond. Um, because I, I can, I, I'm always eager, like I will always admit when I'm, I'm not knowledgeable enough for a situation. And I know that I know people who are more knowledgeable and I'm more, and I feel comfortable in getting that information. And getting that information is from someone who's wiser and older because we go out into the streets my grandmother gave me plenty of stories of how to protect myself and how to be aware and these are the situations she went through and she put part of that information on me and I imparted information on her about what's going on because she had her own feelings about me going out and her beliefs about what Black Lives Matter movement is about. So it's about really connecting, bridging the gap and connecting each other and making that communication line clear. Will you share a little bit more on that? You said uh, your grandmother shared her feelings with you about uh, her perspective on what Black Lives Matter was about? So her, for lack of a better term, she's not buying into all of it. She, yes, I, Jacob understands me. She's I, not I, really- I hear that. Yeah. Um, she's not really buying into all of it. Because again, a lot of, I think it's really just, it's all new. And you don't, you're not always quick to buy into something that's new and different without really understanding it and getting to know it. So I just keep bringing to our attention to my grandma that we keep having these conversations. And yes, it's a back and forth, a tit for tat, but some days, you know, she absorbs it and she's like, okay, you're right. So it's, we're chipping at the wall of her, her disbeliefs, because again, the biggest difference is I'm showing it to her face. And now she's got us like, this is me sharing, physically showing you videos. Like this is what's happening grandma versus me just telling you about it. And you can be like, ah, whatever. But again, that's where I think the disconnect is, is the disbelief and that this is something new because something new is always scary as we've seen in throughout history. So I think it's, we have to, for our old generations to keep showing them what's going on as, as well as for them to keep sharing with us their experiences because we can't negate their experiences as well. Absolutely. I, I got some more on that, but I want to give Deja a chance to, to jump in and, and share her thoughts on the, uh, the differences of between the movements from what i've studied and from what i've seen now and not as bringing up what her grandmother said reminds me of how my grandmother is towards it like there's there's certain cases that she'll hear about and she's like oh okay 
but then she hears about the like the physical like she's seeing this on tv the young people my peers out there protesting and and really just letting themselves be heard and she's like mm, i don't know about that and i feel like it's a cultural thing and i feel what from what i've seen back then it was it was you were black and you were black and you were black and it was just black power not haitian american power not jamaican power not like grit everybody was still inclusive but it wasn't people weren't paying attention to their culture bringing their culture and tying that into social justice and being visually a part of a certain culture specific culture now so i'm seeing a lot of my peers saying okay jamaicans stand with with um black lives matter and specific um cultures raising their voices to let the world essentially know that yes we are different but we're still fighting the same battle like we all understand that this is our fight it's not their fight it's our fight the, hmm. i always have some i don't know what what the best way to describe it is uh does it does it create separation you know i i i tell everybody we all came from africa yeah we all black you know even even white people and sometimes they don't take it well but you know the facts are the facts just as the guy said you can show the facts and they are what they are so when those differentiations are made um does that do anything to uh, hinder progress in any way uh, does that uh do anything to uh, make interactions uh more difficult because i i think amongst those in the i would say older generation that might uh, it definitely did. be looked upon as separation you know it definitely did because when when my grandmother sees certain things that i may do with my friends like she doesn't like she she calls that like a black thing as if like I get where she's coming from because she was born and raised in Haiti. So certain things are just like natural to her. And the, the traditional black experience isn't like one of those things. Like she knows she black, she does. But viewing her and her experiences in society, so like inside of like a black American lifestyle, it's not the same as a lot of people. So certain things, it's just like, oh, okay, you know, I wouldn't do that, but I get it. So, and I know that now, like, it, Haitian people stand together. Haitian people are on the forefront. All the Caribbean and the Latinx people, we are on the forefront together now. So it's not just like, okay, this is a Black American thing. Like, no, this is an American thing. Like, we're all here. We're all together. So I think it, it's, it's definitely decreased the gap. Um, one thing I, I hear often, um, whether it's from folks who are uh, older than me um, and probably uh, folks that are older than you, you guys probably hear, um, it's like a ranking of the experiences. We had it worse and we were walking uphill five miles in the snow in the summertime of school and everything like that. So. Um, just I want to give each one of you guys a, an opportunity to uh, share what, what, what was your first experience with um, racism discrimination uh, what what is something that put the fuel um, in you for social activism um, circle back to Jacob uh, so for me I've uh, experience racism young. Um, I, I'm both black and Hispanic, black Hispanic. Um, my father's from Panama, but he's a black Hispanic. My mother is from Red Hook, Brooklyn. My family moved to Long Island after my grandfather fought in World War II. And so honoring both identities and where I'm at in those spaces. Um, I was the only black kid in predominantly an all-white school because of my learning disability, even though I'm born and raised in Roosevelt. 
Um, and it wasn't a private school, it was another public school because of my disability. And so there was a cross partnership to ensure that I received services. Um, and I could clearly remember being called the N word by one of my peers because they thought it was appropriate that they heard it in a rap song um, and had to have that conversation. Then became class president for four years with my high school with locks in my head and still having to deal with microaggressions. So I've learned a lot about racism, even though it was not afflicted in all of the folks that I had. Um, so from that moment on, also seeing my family who had a lineage of service, whether it was through education, social work, um, organizing, health, um, all take different roles of activism. That's what sparked me to understanding. And so from my own experience of taking a bus ride 20 minutes away to another zip code, to get services because my home community at the time didn't have it versus what it was today. Um, that's what sparked me to get into this field because I didn't feel that those inequities should exist for my other black friends that didn't have that same opportunity. Um, and so for me, that's where it sparked for me. So I've experienced it even up until this day as a nonprofit leader um, on Long Island where there are times that the table being asked, why do I have to seat at the table? <laughs> you know, how do I, as this black man being here, having a conversation and not and being seen as a threat rather than an asset to the conversation? And so um, all that to say that has it impacted some funding decisions? Yes. Has it impacted some opportunities for me to move the needle forward for my community to reach progress? Yes. Do I, am I aware of it? Absolutely. And I think if anything, I've learned how to be more stronger in my response and be more, um, clear, especially now, and unintentionally um, in Black and not being afraid to do so. Um, and so that's where all of it sparked out. But I, I've had it very early on, as early as young as fifth grade, um, and learning how to navigate those spaces very differently and having to talk with my parents that it's not the same um, as it is. So those are some of my background of how I got to it. Thank you. Nadesh? So for me, I didn't experience blatant racism till I was in high school. Um, as we, um, some of the racism that I experienced was more towards like colorism because I am more fair skinned and I was aware of that my whole life. Um, and my mother is black, but she's very fair, and my father is Haitian and he's very dark skinned. So, like I was like I'm aware of my blackness and I grew up being black and proud of that. Um, but it wasn't till maybe early elementary school where I experienced the, the small microaggressions of like, well, you look Dominican. Well, are you sure you're black? You look mixed. Oh, you're so pretty. Like, you know, for a, for a black girl, are you sure you're black? I got like people questioned my blackness. So I questioned it myself. And I went to predominantly white institutions my entire life. So I conform. I always had my hair straight. I never wanted braids. I hated when mom put my braids in my hair. And it wasn't until high school. I remember this exact moment. And this is, I think, what was like what clicked for me. I was a junior in high school. I was vice president of National Honor Society, and it was the blood drive. And I went to donate blood. And at, the nurse comes up to me, and he starts speaking Spanish. And I was like, I'm sorry. I like, I was like, I, I was like, my Spanish is very limited. Like, I don't take Spanish class. And he was like, How dare you not speak the language of your country? And I was like, But I'm not, I'm not Hispanic. Like, I'm not Latino. I'm not Hispanic. He was like, Oh, so your mom is white. And that was the moment where I was like, Wow. Like as a kid, you don't you don't listen to it. But like now, I'm like, I'm grown and I'm like, Wow. And I said, Can I have a new nurse, please? <laughs> and going to, I went to an all-girl Catholic high school. There was five black girls in my grade, five. And I think for me, where I wanted to take my social action was I was like, I gotta come back here and make a difference. So that's what pushed me to go to another predominantly white institution. And I love my school now and I work so hard to bring equality and equity to the students. I actually work now at my high school. I'm the assistant advisor for the BSU and there was no such thing as a BSU that wasn't even thought when I was in high school so I co-advised them and that's what really sparked my need I was like I want like I want to help the, st the students that are in low income areas but a lot of us neglect those students who are like we the black students who are more privileged and like they're in these spaces where they have no black teachers my high school one black teacher and he was a male 
and I never had him in a class because he only taught honors economics. So I never got to experience having even a black professor until college. So I want, so right now my major is education. Like that's where I find my socials is going back into those communities where you have very limited representation and you have these black kids with no role models. And that's like where I feel most, like where I feel I most needed at. Because a lot of us think immediately to go and help those students who are in the low income areas. And a lot of us are there and I think more of us should go there. But I think where I feel, where I feel like I need to be and where I need to work on improving racism and equity and equality is in those areas as well. So I'm definitely gonna get back to you on the uh, role model uh, thing because it's definitely something I, I'd like to uh, ask both of you. Uh, but first, uh, Deja, if you could share your uh, previous experiences uh, with racism, discrimination, what built that social activist in you. So, funny that Nadej mentioned high school because I, I knew she was going to mention high school because our high schools were sister schools. So, it they it's, it's about seven schools in the um, Sisters of St. Joseph bunch. Um, mine being the Mary Lewis Academy. We're in Jamaica, Queens. You know, you, you would think, pre well, technically Jamaica is states. So, the more traditionally uppity part of Jamaica. And I knew my mom actually went to high school on Jamaica Avenue, like further down the hill, because my school's technically like up a hill. So her old high school used to call my high school Snob Hill. And I was like, I just thought that, you know, maybe because they were a private school. So I figured, okay, you know, they just got money. That's fine. No, no, it wasn't until like I actually got there. And I realized that the only people that looked like me were peers and the cleaning staff. I had no black teachers in high school, but thankfully my experience in middle school and elementary school definitely like honed in that, okay, you're black, you love that you're black. Okay, don't forget that. So going there, I was like, you know, proud of my blackness. I didn't really have an issue with not seeing myself because I saw myself and my friends, I was fine. And it wasn't until I helped out at an alumni reunion my sophomore year and a woman comes up to the registration table and she's like, oh, do you go here? And, and I said, yes. I said, they don't, they don't let strangers hang out at the alumni reunions. She's like, Oh, it's just, I didn't think they would like girls like you in here. I was stunned, to say the least. And I'm like, oh, wow, <laughs> this is what it feels like. And it's like you hear these stories about the things that people say to, to Black girls and Black men. And, and then to hear it through your own ears, like in your face, it, it, it's infuriating. And it's also, I would say, empowering because I, I'll remember that for the rest of my life. And it's, it's a story I'll tell my kids because I would, I would still send my kids to Mary Lewis. It's, a, it's an amazing education. And I would send them there, especially now because we're building such a strong, um, such a strong relationship as alumni with the girls now that those girls will never feel the way that a lot of me and my peers did so uncomfortable in that situation. Like we want that. I don't need a bad education for my child to, to just be okay with being black. Like I want her to have a good education, but I also want her to know where she came from, be comfortable with where she came from. And I'm glad that I'm able to help with that. And it's just, it's, it really does start an education for a lot of people. Uh, um, it seems you guys, um, although you, you, you clearly had some, some experiences, um, you may have had, like, like, like Nadez, you mentioned, uh, your school experience was maybe a little bit better than your average, uh, public school that a lot of our young black children attend. Um, 
you guys all mentioned not having black teachers and that sort of thing. Um, so the, the question that I mentioned uh, that came to mind earlier was, who, if anybody, was that um, person to help you uh, develop that resilience to, um, you know, push through uh, your experiences? And, you know, I'm predictable, so we'll, we'll circle back to Jacob. So for me, um, because I didn't have a black educator period until college, um, it was really hard for me. My educators, I had to realize, were outside of the classroom. So it would be like the, the two black male educators that I had in my after school program, for instance, that I volunteered at, one who was a special education teacher, one was a social worker. They're still my mentors to today. I counted them as a teacher. Um, because they were able to talk to me about the nuances and different things that I didn't see otherwise. Um, and outside of my parents and my family, you know, I come from a space of privilege where I had a two-parent household and a family of five, whereas others may have different family dynamics. Um, you know, all of them helped me figure out how to be more resilient in my space and hold true to my Blackness and not be afraid of doing that. Um, but, you know, frankly, it wasn't until my sophomore year a college at Penn State University, University Park as an undergrad where I had my first black professor who I felt spoke truth to power on so many issues that finally I felt valid. I felt like I was seen. Um, and this is not to say that all of my educators that were there, I have a special education teacher afterwards because of my experience. Um, in fact, it was a white teacher that was in fourth grade that made me understand what special education was really about. It wasn't me being dumb or stupid. It was the fact that we all learned differently. Um, you know, all those things came about, so it's not to say they didn't have it, but I truly do believe that representation matters. Um, and I didn't get to see that, unfortunately, until college. And I think that's and the fact that it's still a struggle on Long Island, um, and particularly in Nassau County, I think it's an issue that we need to address more issues and why this movement is so important to address that. So for me, I didn't have necessarily an educator within a formal school setting, and I wish I did. Um, but I don't take away from the experience that I had because I felt like through the educators, they tried their best to do it. It just wasn't necessarily connected with terms of who I am and seeing people who look like me. Nadesh? For me, it was my father. Um, like Jacob said, I, Jacob said, I came from a home of privilege. I have my two loving parents. I have a younger brother. We live in a nice house. My family all lived 15 minutes apart from each other because that's what big immigrant families do. <laughs> um, and I went to Montessori school from pre-K to eighth grade. Then I went to Sacred Heart Academy and I'm so blessed and so grateful for, the, for having these opportunities. But at the same time, again, I did not have a black educator till college. My sophomore year, I took African, black and Caribbean studies class. And that's where I felt like it made sense. Growing up, my father like, I had class from 8 a.m. to 3.30, came home, had my little homework dinner time, the dinner Real table, class. class number two starts. Real and class. that's where I s sat down with my dad and he gave me all of Black, all of black history that he could. Because um, I still think today we still don't know all of our history. And I think that's such a huge issue that we don't and that it's not taught and that we can't pass down all these traditions and history that we should have had the opportunity and we deserve the opportunity to learn. Um, so for me, it was my father. Um, my dad made sure I was in so many extracurriculars. I played soccer and I played soccer and he created a club where it was predominantly black kids. So that's where I was able to experience being about black kids because in the school day, there's only five of us that were of color. And when there's only five of you, there's not many options of friendship. And I'm not gonna lie, we all weren't friends. And that's okay <laughs> where everyone in my school assumed that we all be friends because we lunch together well we're all eating lunch together because we're all black but they thought we were best of friends and that's where I had my teachers my soccer coaches my father my parent like my mother that's where I got my education from my proudest to be black because outside of that from other than my formal education like I wasn't getting that um because like I said I conformed I've straightened my hair my mom never let me permit, but every Saturday morning, made sure it was pinned straight, always looked pressed crisp, always wore, I've been wearing pearls since I was 10. <laughs> um, 
so there is this image you have to uphold. And I think that's another thing we can eventually talk about is how the code switching and the conformity and how that does affect the child psyche. Because I can say like, Deja knows like every time we have to talk about black issues, I'm like, I don't feel equipped <laughs> because I like, that's just how I, like, I just, I always feel like I'm not equipped because I didn't get the experiences some other black kids may have of the, that they were able to have those experience having black teachers and black experience than I had. Another another question comes to mind, but I, I will go to Deja first. Please share. Oh. In fact, that was a lot to 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 take in because I, I I resonated with a lot of it. I other than middle school and elementary school, which I have to hold dear and really appreciate all the black teachers that I did have and the teachers that made sure that um, Black History Month wasn't just the month and it wasn't just two days out of the whole week of February that we decided to talk about Black history and other people other than Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks because there were more and they knew that there were more. So I, I, I thank most of them for letting me, giving me that first indication that there was more than what the books were letting on than what society led on and then it wasn't until college that I took a black studies course and I was like oh right there's more I almost like that four-year gap it could have taken me out because I, 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 a lot was missing I was going to school every day and not it was like it, it something was missing I was missing from what I was learning and I didn't pay attention to it. So when it was brought back to me, I was like, oh, right. You know, we were here for all of this history and like we have our own specific history. So it's like being able to be taught that. Sorry, I got off track. The person, <laughs> the professor who was the cha who is the chair of the African Black and Caribbean Studies Department at Adelphi taught most of the classes in that department. So everybody got a taste of her. She taught like specific black history classes. She taught classes about the Caribbean. She taught classes about black writers, black culture. So everybody got different pieces and we all wanted more. Everybody would want to take her class. Her classes would be full every single semester. And eventually she became my mentor. I would just every conversation with her, I was just learning so, so much. I was like, the fact that I'm not learning this, or that, that, the fact that I haven't learned this already, and it's just taken me so, I feel like it's taken me so long, it's, it's heartbreaking. So I try to educate the younger people in my life. I educate my peers. I tell them everything that she tells me. I'm like, let me just tell you what I spoke to, to Dr. Darling about. Like, she's a woman with a PhD, so I'm already holding her to an even higher standard. I'm like, she's a brilliant woman. And getting that, that, um, getting that relationship so late in life, like, granted, the women in my life, phenomenal women. But this is like, this is a, this is a legit educator, a woman with a PhD. Oh, she's teaching. She's like, te she's teaching as the masses. I'm like, I that's she teaches me to teach people which is the most important part so it doesn't matter who teaches you but are you teaching also thank you thank you um uh one one thing i just had to i just had to say it um I, it must be a coincidence but there's there are two people two more people on the on this call who had a fourth grade teacher who was white who made it her business to communicate that uh, Black history uh, was 365 days a year. Uh, we learned more than about just Martin Luther King. Her, her house uh, was actually a stop on the Underground Railroad and um, taking that class trip to her house to see underneath the porch and the chair that uh, a, a runaway slave had, had sat in at some point in time, you know, it was very, very moving. So I just wanted to um, share that. But I also want to say it, it seems like 
you guys you all, all have mentioned having a yearning for more knowledge of, of self and, and as far as black history and that sort of thing and um i think that's something that a lot of the older generation might assume that those in the younger generation were not as interested in uh taking the time to take in uh, i don't know um if that's impacted by some of your backgrounds being a little bit different than I would say your your average uh, let me say how to say it how the 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 negative the things that are assumed about your average uh, young person of color in regards to um, the things they're into the things that would resonate with them, um, learning about their history, uh, a lot might assume that doesn't resonate with them. But what, what we're hearing from you guys is uh, that that's different. Um, what do you hear? What What is your take on on that point? As far as your peers and their you know interest in that. So I surround myself by people who believe in the importance of learning their history in order to move things forward. Um, only because that's the energy that I vibe with. That's the frequency that I want to live by. Um, that's a personal value. And, you know, we can agree to disagree on a lot of perspectives. We can share that, but there's a commonality that we have to be able to learn from others. I mean, just recently I read um, the book over again by um, Evelyn Brooks, um, him and Rothman on the righteousness discount, the right of uh, the women's movement in the Black Baptist Church to talk about respectability politics and what it means. Um, because I felt like that was a term that was coming up recently and I knew that that was going to be, you know, potentially a topic of conversation here. So I was like, you know what, let me go ahead and look into this and seeing it. And it's a book that coined it, you know, that phrase and talked about what it looks like. And again, I was also in spaces of where as a male, making sure that I want to make sure that I honor the full value and significance of the Black woman. And I need to have more history of myself of what that looks like and remove my own biases and assumptions about things. And so for me, what I hear on the ground, especially around my generation, is that we need to be able to have more of a broader understanding and knowledge of history than what was taught to us because we have an acknowledgement and understanding that what was taught was not necessarily full-scale history or someone else's version of it. Um, and we're not afraid to be able to take the leap and balance to figure that out or to put the puzzle pieces together or do our own research and speak on that. I think that in comparison to understanding the stories and what gets passed down from generation to generation, which is its own form of history, even myself now as an adjunct professor at um, Bank Street College of Education, you know, I'm more intentional to make sure that I put in black authors in my syllabus than I have seen before in a predominant white space. Um, and being clear that I'm going to make sure that our folks understand that. So I just I ride around people who understand it. It's a different vibe and energy, but it also doesn't mean that there's also young folks who aren't taking the time to do that. But I think they are looking more so towards the instant gratification of like quick information available through social media or other tools to figure out that knowledge that they can see in a video in five minutes versus me picking up a book to do it. That doesn't mean they're both not education. It's just that they may be more in depth in other spaces, but we're all still learning. So I think there's different modalities that we all have to experience as well when it comes to that. Thank you, thank you. Nadesh? Yeah, to piggy off, piggyback off of Jacob, um, I think that's, the common misconception of our younger generation is that where like where they're getting their information from and what the level of validity that older generations feel that it is a five minute video versus reading a hundred page book um yes like there are differences but they're getting this is where they feel they're they're getting their information from so i think that's a misconception of thinking that that five minute video has no value whatsoever i think it does i think that it can be a jumping off point and be can it can be in spark or it can be just enough for now um, because our generation and younger than us, they don't have the mindset of, okay, I got to go to the library and I got to go get the microfiche and I got to go look through the book and I got to go through the Dewey right. Decimal System. <laughs> <laughs> like that, that I, I told my, I asked my brother one day, he's four years younger than me, but I was like, do you know what a microfiche is? He said, a what? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think, again, 
how our gen technology has grown exponentially. So the, I think that's what's created the gap, bet gap between the generations of understanding of how we're getting information, how we're learning. Um, I also think that yes, our generation has to be a little more curious um, and broaden their expansion of what, where they can learn. And I think at the same token, our older generation can't just have the expectation to sit and wait and come to me mm -hmm. kind of mentality. Because I, I learned that from my grandmother, she was kind of sitting and waiting for me to come to her and sit at, sit across from her at the table, like tell me everything, you know, by the same play. Like, so I think to kind of bridge that gap, I think we should just spend time with our grandparents. If your grandparents are around, if you're lucky to have them, go make dinner with them some one day. Like my grandma, like if once you, the pockets stir and the words start flowing and I learn a lot. Um, she'll tell me about her time and growing up in Haiti and then coming to America and experiencing um, the whole AIDS, AIDS issue where it was being blamed on Haitians and how she was on the bridge with my grandfather. And like, like, and you learn all about this information. So I think it, again, it's a two way street. I think we have to go to them, but then they also can meet us in the middle understanding like how we receive information. And Deja, finish off that question. I definitely agree with what Jacob and Nader said. I feel to, to piggyback directly off the last point that Nader, that Nader made, talking to the older generation, they open up and you learn so much. It doesn't have to be anybody that you're related to. Older people love to talk. <laughs> they will talk to anybody. They'll talk about anything. All of the I used to work in the Black Studies Department, so I would be surrounded by all of their peers, and they would just love to talk. And I, sometimes I ask, sometimes I don't, but just having an outlet for them, I know is definitely worthwhile. And just me getting that information, I, I'm loving it. But um, what I wanted to make a point about was we were, I understand where that, that, um, where they're coming from when they say, when they're saying that the younger generation doesn't really want to get involved. We don't really want to learn about things because one being we were turned off to history. Like we, we learned about George Washington and Abraham Lincoln every day for four years or six years and we were just like we don't want no more history like stop to stop like just giving us all this stuff like we don't really want it so when the space opened up for us to learn about our own history we're like uh do we really need to learn about like i'm black i, I kind of know what's going on but then there was just like a turning point and i feel like that was around like 2016 2017 where it just flipped for a lot of young people. Like we realized that, okay, this was our history. This is what they wanted. And at the same time, we were also being taught that what we have now is enough. Like integration is fine. Like you're in these spaces, you're allowed to sit at the table now. And, and the young people just came and we, like, we're like, okay, that's what we had. But that's not what we want. That's not enough anymore. We don't want to just be in the spaces. We want to be comfortable in the spaces. We want to make our own spaces. So I feel like 2016 was definitely a turning point that I saw within myself, within my peers, that we were just definitely getting out there more. Thank you. Uh, Jacob, you mentioned something about uh, the Black church. So with that, I am going to... Uh, pass it along to my fellow social action committee member, Mr. Reese Vanderhall. I know you guys saw another young activist in the screen, uh, Dean. He often gives his input. So, <laughs> Reese. I apologize. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Oh, do I have a good connection? I think good? you're good. <laughs> okay, perfect. Thank you. So I've been listening to some of what um, you all have been saying about your personal experiences. And I, I just want to, I just want to ask, um, in terms of the Black Lives Matter movement and millennials now driving many of our social movements, do you think that there's still room for the Black church in this? And um, if it's 
necessary, what's the role that the black church plays now in social movements? And so I'm so here's here's I'm sorry, I apologize. I know that you guys have been going like in order. I kind of throw that out there. And whoever wants to take it, let's just go with it and have an organic conversation. Um, I think that we're supposed to cut up at seven. That's we got four minutes left. We may go a little over, but let's just, you know, chime in. Tell me what you think. Can I can I grab it first? Yes, please. Yes, yes, please. <laughs> So real quick, my godmother is yeah. very influential in her church and her ministry. And I used to be as well. And I feel like there was, she asked me the other day, she was like, what's the disconnect with the young people? And I was like, you know, young people now are a lot different than young people when you guys were young. Like we're fluid, we're, we're flamboyant. We're like crazy sometimes. Like we can be honed in true, but we're not like the standard model fit anymore. Like, we don't just, you know, girls wear skirts, boys wear pants. Like, we're different. And I feel like once the church, I've, many churches have definitely done this. There are so many come-as-you-are churches, and it's beautiful now. But there's a lot of the ones who are the ones that are still questioning, where's the disconnect that aren't giving us the room for that fluidity? And, and we're the ones out in the streets trying to do our best and we know that with the support of the church this 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 it's already definitely big and it's growing but it can grow even more and to have that pretty much that adult support there it it would definitely mean a lot to us interesting interesting it's it it, it certainly is a valid point especially when you think about traditional religion um and how um misogynistic it could be right in the black church um how you know anti um same-sex relationship it could be in the black church it it it, it begs the question is there still room in social movements so when you talk about certainly having those elders there and those people there um, then that kind of leads me to my next question. How do you all feel about respectability politics, right? This whole idea that if we start policing each other and taking care of each other, then we can, the, we can demand respect from the majority. So I'll take that on really yeah, quickly. I see. I, um, Jacob, I saw you like itching. I was trying <laughs> to figure this out because I feel like the origin of respectability politics came from a standpoint that whiteness is the standard. And I'm not about that life. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's just that at the end of the day, like, because I should be conditioned to look like them, then I can conform better to them. I'm sorry. I think there's a difference between being raised with decorum, respect, and etiquette versus switching it over to respectability politics so that I can fit better into the masses and then correct my own people and their language and their way of being and their behavior and have to tell them whether or not it's valid or not. You know, we may all have our moments, but that doesn't mean necessarily that one is more or less important than the other. And so I just think that creating that standard against whiteness as the moral thing that we all need to because that's better to connect with the majority I just, I don't, it doesn't sit well with me. And I think that's our respectability, respectability politics. And I just don't go hand in hand. <laughs> but that's my opinion on it. <laughs> but what, one, one thing though, with, with that, is there ever a point when it, it's valuable to, you know, play the game to a certain extent to a certain end? I think there is a, I think there is a value in playing the game, but I think playing the game is recognizing that it's, that's just strategy, but I think it's conforming to modeling the same exact behavior as this other person to get to where I need to is indirectly conforming to the fact that their way is the right way. So like, for me, it's like, I, I have a, I have an issue with like, for me to feel like I am in a room with a white person, I will have to sit there. And because for instance, I may sit up a little bit more, I may look up a certain way because the white person is doing it. That's all part of the game. But to me, it's like, if I feel like I want to sit like this where my hands are on the table, he puts his hands beneath the table. That doesn't mean it's one and the same. 
But for them, it's like, oh, the white person looks more apparent and more in it than the black person. I just mean just put my hands underneath the table because it feels more comfortable to me. So I feel like, again, it's just the standard piece that I think is the important part of it. I think this just all comes in how do you, how do you navigate the system in a way that allows you to still be unapologetic you while also meeting the goal that you have in hand? And I think we as a people have not had a full conversation about that because we've been constantly conditioned that what we feel is not valid or enough. And I think that's a bigger conversation I think we need to have for another day. <laughs> so I hear you. <laughs> right, right. So those conversations that you're talking about that we haven't had, is there a necessity for conversations to happen in-house about culture and pride, right? So if we look at segregation and look at how our children were educated, look at studies about how children fare better when they um, see a black teacher earlier on in their primary education. If we have conversations with just us about pride and culture, do you think that that leads to that unapologetic blackness, right? That will lead to what some may term respectability politics because now when I walk down the street with my head held high and I have these two or three degrees I'm just telling you facts right I'm not here because of affirmative action I'm not here because of a handout I'm here because I'm supposed to be here so respect me right does that make sense so does that do you think that there is there is uh some justification for respectability politics at all. And I say that because when you look at the civil rights movement and the Black Lives Matter movement, so the civil rights movement, there was this concern about having the perfect person to kind of mobilize around, like a Rosa Parks. I like that term, I always use, I always say this person isn't Rosa Parks, right? Can I take this case to trial? I'm, a, I'm an attorney. Um, but <laughs> right, the Black they Lives couldn't Matter take because they couldn't take Claudette. The credibility of the person. I'm sorry? I was saying because they because they were not going to allow Claudette Calvin to be the representative, being that she punched the bus driver in the face the week before Rosa sat down, and she was also, you know, with child. Right. <laughs> right. So right. the fact that she refused her seat a couple weeks before Rosa is not something that's often, you know, publicized because she didn't fit the mold of who we wanted to present. But I'll let you go on. I apologize. Right. So, so what I love about these current social movements is, is they don't care about whether you're Rosa Parks or someone else. It's like right is right and wrong is wrong. It's get your foot off my neck. Right, it doesn't matter what I did. Um, but my question to you three, uh, um, as people who are obviously in the trenches, on the front lines, who are well-read, um, maybe part of the talented 10th, we're gonna, I'm gonna touch on that. Should there be a balance between the, the ideas of what respectability politics is, right? And what Jacob just talked about, being unapologetically black. Nadege, I see you yeah, shaking your of, head. Go ahead. I really think it still comes back to like when you talked about the mold, like where was that mold based off of? That mold was based off something that white people could ingest, something that was tolerable right. enough for them to take in. And I think that's like that's yeah. how ingrained racism is in our country, is that even for us as black people, like when we're looking for a standard, a model, it's a byproduct of that systemic racism. And I think to truly be unapologetically ourselves, we just got to unapologetically be ourselves. And you also mentioned like bringing it to the homes. I think we do have to have that conversation with our, with our sisters and brothers and our peers of how we're going to address our children. Because how my father addressed me was very small things were like, I had to always order my own food. If I wanted extra ketchup packets, I had to walk up to the lady at McDonald's and ask for those extra ketchup packets. Always these small things that we have to do to build our children's confidence 
Um, and I think having those conversations with them um, from early on and then always altering the conversation yearly, monthly, however you see fit, I think is important because, I don't wanna say this, because if we don't tell them how mm -hmm. wonderful they are and how, how to be unapologetic of themselves, someone else is gonna tell them. And that someone Absolutely. else is going to be their white teach bear, is going to be that white right. coach on the, on the sports team or the dance team. And it, they're gonna tell them this is how you're supposed to act. When that's not true, how you're supposed to act is, and that's what we have to discuss, how are we supposed to act outside of what white people have told us and in, ingrained and molded us into. So I that's what you're add really quickly just to that point, because I, I think it's important also part of the conversation so I could pass it to so she could wrap this up for yeah. <laughs> while we go through. Because I think it's important to also keep in mind, right, that when you brought up the example, Kira, about who was the right person to represent, I think it's just like if you're in the middle of a conflict and you know you're not the right messenger for the conversation, you're willing to back down because you know that you're not necessarily the right face for the conversation. But when it comes down to systems, mm -hmm or different institutions of oppression, that then becomes the whole respectability area because now you're dealing with people's lives that are in the masses versus a one-on-one -on -one conversation. So there's a different layer to now, am I the right messenger for this? AKA, as Nigel just said, who can more conform to me to feel comfortable to have the conversation? I'm sorry, if you don't like the brasses, you don't like the brasses. If you don't like me saying what I need to say, I need to say. I think it's all an articulation and eloquence and how people can feel into sometimes you have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. It's hard, but it's sometimes necessary in order to move the agenda forward. So I, I do think there is sometimes a role in respectability politics, but I do think that, again, it goes back to what we discussed so far about the standard of who is that against, you know, and how do we see that within ourselves as a people? Right. So I'm going to leave that there. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. So oh, my, my last question, because um, we're over, but I, I have to ask this question to you all because you obviously um, you shared with us today, you've had a lot to say and you have a lot of insight. We're talking about local politics here. I think everyone on this call is for the most part is from Nassau County. So we're talking about local politics, right? And we're talking about local movements. Is, what's the talented tenth's role? Do they still exist here in Nassau County? And if they do, what's the role? Is it still lift as we climb? And then how do we do that? How do we go from here? Where do we go from here? Jacob is like hopping out of his seat again. <laughs> I was trying to respect the video of the other folks wanted to go <laughs> beforehand. It's up to y'all. Anybody? Okay, so. Yeah, um, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, that's yeah. fine. No, I was going to. So here's, here's my perspective of it. I think that everyone has a role. Everyone has a role right. in the movement. And I go back to the instance of my paternal grandmother who came from Panama and was here during the time of the civil rights movement, having an eighth grade education, but still cooked and provided room and spaces for them. She was a part of the movement. Now, because she didn't have a degree, because she didn't have the same level of eloquence mm -hmm. in her articulation, but she said what she said, that was her voice and it mattered. And so for me, it's like, yes, I do believe in climbing of it, but I think the role have shifted in terms of whether or not does a full level, I am a value of an education. I think that it's an equalizer of opportunity, but it doesn't necessarily mean that because I have one less than the other, that I should top my privilege and try to bring it up. Instead, I think is that we need to create, how do we create more of a baseline for our people, regardless of their role and responsibility to be a part of it. So that's my two cents on it. I just think that it, it you know, there needs to be more of a baseline of an opportunity and not feel like there's more or less of the other. Yes, there's privileges connected to it, but you know, I'm not really sure on it. <laughs> I Respect. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I, when I learned about the Talented Tenth, I was like, okay, that was, that was nice. But why is there the, why is there the divide? And why is there the, 
we're looking to them to help us. Why can't we all just be helping each other just because? And I, I think that's the most important though in education. Even if it's education, like everything is education. If you're asking your mom, how do I boil pasta? You're asking a teacher, what's two plus two? That's all education. And it doesn't matter how high up or so-called or essentially how high up you would I'm putting up quotation marks even though you guys can't see me but how high up in education you're going you're still learning and growing and teaching other people so it's it's really it's really the individual coming together as one single collective rather than there's this there's group a who's supposed to help group b and in order to get like group B, you have to do all of these things and you have to, to speak this way and talk this way and act this way. Like, no, it's just us as people trying to better ourselves together. Just one thing. Right. So, right. I don't want to say like the talented tenth doesn't exist anymore, but I think it's definitely changed because again, People are on YouTube University, and I can say they probably know more than I do on from. <laughs> um, so I think that just like they just said, everything is a level of education, um, and to assume that right, the like this these sort of people who got this kind of education are going to be our leaders, when a lot of our a lot of leaders today don't have the formal education that we have, but they are out in the streets and they're taking charge. I think our talent and intent are the people who are stepping up and taking on the role of helping us organize and helping us push forward as a group and helping each other out. I don't think that it's these set group of people that we have to establish are going to be our leaders and tell us what to do and say, because that's what, ha that was what was, ha was happening. Because again, the level of, inf the speed and accessibility to information was a lot different than it is now. So I think now that we can we can gain more information and get it much faster. I think that talented tenth definition needs to shift, and that's what I'm going to say about that. And the right to education has changed yeah. as well. Yeah, you know, for Black people, whereas then it didn't, it wasn't, it was not existent until that point. So I think there's a lot of nuances that we need to develop within the current times, but still, nevertheless, it's still applicable. All right. Thank you all very, very much. I'm going, I, we're way over. Um, I'm gonna turn it back over to Kira so she can close. But um, I, I want, I'd love to continue this conversation. So I hope, hope you all are available for a future date. Look, I'm already committing you to something else. <laughs> but I'm gonna turn it back over to Kira Bryan. Thank you so, so much. Yes, thank you guys. And um, you know, as Jacob, you've mentioned, uh, this is, there are so many things that we touched upon that we need to discuss further. So, um, you know, as we were exploring who to uh, showcase this week, uh, it, it, it became clear to us that this is a conversation that we need to continue. So uh, we will be continuing, continuing this topic uh, for future uh, Wolf Wednesday lives going forward um, throughout the summer uh, in the least. So thank you guys uh, again. And, um, you know, keep the action and social action. Keep that fight going. Um, you know, things to take away for uh, the community. Uh, we were encouraged to just spend time with people of the other generations to learn from them, always go into it looking to learn from each other. Uh, not that you're the only one who could teach and um, it's, it's not a one-way street. It's always gotta be a, a two-way street. And the importance of uh, the impact of a solid education. Um, so. You know, um, we will be doing more things to try to promote that uh, with our social action activities. Uh, Nadej, I know you and Deja will be down with that. We're going to have some social action uh, theaters going on. 
Um, yes, I see um, also um, shout out from uh, Devin Payton Jones, Suffolk County uh, alumni chapter, social action chair. We're going to partner so we make sure that the, the island is educated about um, the, the foundation, our, our social action foundation, and um, also has the opportunity to learn from the younger generation. So thank you, everybody uh, who joined us. And um, see you for upcoming events. Thank you. Good night. Along the live, and we still.